I'm super excited to um to see everyone here. Um, thanks for for signing on for this little extra session. Um, uh, I, uh, as as Sebash was saying, I come from um, lots of years of um, youth direct youth work practice, um, mainly in um, housing and homelessness. Um, in, I started out in country Victoria and um, uh, I also worked in Darwin and in Brisbane and, and back in Melbourne um, as well. So um, kind of all around the place. Um, but for the last um, 22 years, uh, um, I've been uh, um, an academic here. Uh, um, and so uh, I teach... Um, the youth work units um, here, as well as a bunch of other units at, at here. Here's at QUT. I'm in my office here. You all know where I am uh, at uh, at QUT. Um, and uh, yeah, so I teach into the undergraduate course um, and also the masters of social work course. Um, it's kind of funny because after 22 years of um, teaching, I kind of feel like. There's a whole lot of youth workers out there who have probably done classes with me at some point. <laughs> and that's kind of fun to think about. Um, but today we're gonna we're gonna talk about about critical youth work and and I really like talking about critical youth work and talking about it in a whole range of different ways. Um, uh, I think. Um, um, Youth work is um, is one of the few areas of of social work, human service practice, where every single person who does it has lived experience. Um, so everyone's been a young person. Yeah, everyone has lived experience of being a young person. Not everyone has lived experience of being homeless or mental health issues or drug and alcohol issues or, you know, any of the other kind of areas of practice that that we might engage in. But every single person's been a youth worker. And when we um, think about people with lived experience, there's all of these processes that we kind of go through in terms of of ensuring that they critically reflect on their own experience and um, and and check in about whether they're just reading through their own experience and you know reading someone else's story through their own experience and and which is all really important things to do um, but we don't explicitly do that when we're talking about youth work even though every single one of us has lived experience of being a young person. Um, and, I, and I hear it constantly, both with youth workers and with students, um, you know, people going, well, when I was a young person or, or you know, my friends or, uh, you know, or, or my child as a young person, you know, like who's a young person now, you know, so we often read it through that personal lens. Um, so, so for that reason, I think thinking of critically about youth work is important. Um, and the other reason that I think that critical youth work, a critical youth work focus is important is because um, working with young people is really complex work. You all know that. You're all doing it. It's really complex work. It's really hard work. It's highly skilled work. Um, and and I think that there's a kind of an anti-intellectualism that happens around youth work um, where it's kind of seen to be just an entry level thing. It's seen to be something that you can just kind of wing with a TAFE degree, a, a TAFE diploma, and you know, and a, a bit of time in a resi care unit, and that'll kind of set you up for you know. And you get into the resi care unit, and you go, "Holy crap, this is actually really hard work, isn't it?" You know, like I'm 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 working with some really big complex issues here. Yeah, and and sometimes. If we don't, um, if we haven't done that critical thinking work, we just fall back on kind of standard learnt responses, particularly if we're if we're feeling stressed, feeling tired, feeling unsupported. You know, and so many of us in our work these days feel unsupported um, by neoliberal managerial kind of work environments, um, and so 
So for all of those reasons, um, I, I think it's important that we uh, spend some time focusing on critical youth work. Uh, um, so I've got I've got a bunch of, you know, I'm a lecturer, I've got a bunch of PowerPoint slides. That's that's my jam, that's how we roll. Uh, some of them you'll recognise if you were in the first session that we did where I just kind of ran through a bit of what's youth work. Um, uh, and, but then I'm going to extend on on them yeah so because I didn't post those slides up so I just thought we'll just kind of have a bit of a bit of a go through them um I uh I'm quite happy to be interrupted while I'm talking you know like I'm quite I'm not precious about that um and there and at the end there's there's going to be time I want you to do some work, basically. <laughs> I'm going to be asking you some questions and you can ask questions of each other because the thing is you're the ones with the current youth work practice expertise. I haven't been a direct practitioner for a long time, yeah? So you're the ones who need to be thinking and talking and working through this stuff um, and going, how do we implement these ideas in practice? You know, how can these shape our practice? And that's where I get to learn from you because it's all very well for me to sit here and, you know, talk. Um, but you're the ones who are implementing this stuff in practice, yeah? So that all being said, uh, let me just get the old slides up. Hang on. Um, all right. Can people see them? Uh, excellently excellent let me just make it big go big there we go and I'll make all the faces go away uh, okay so critical youth work a practice of love I've called it and uh, we'll we'll unpack why I why the heck I'm talking about love when we uh, when we talk about this um, uh, so uh things that um that we talked about um already um in the first session you know so uh but just to kind of remind you all um youth is a is a social con the idea of youth is a social construction you know there there isn't actually a a period of life um that is being a young person you know, like it's not a you're either biologically a child or biologically an adult and the bit in the middle is just made up you know and it has been made up for for you know a really long time um for a whole range of reasons and because it's made up then um then people can put all kinds of different constructions into um the way we think about about young people and so one of the first ways of thinking about young people came from Granville Stanley Hall in 1907 or 4. I can never remember whether it's 1904 or 1907 when I'm on the spot. But anyway, it doesn't matter. A bloody long time ago, suffice to say. Um, and uh, and he talked about, um, about the period of youth or adolescence, as he called it, being a time of storm and stress. Yeah, now, I'm not going to go a lot into these theories. It's just interesting that so he said that because of raging hormones, all young people experiencing experience this really um, stressful time, you know, this really difficult time in their lives. Um, and when we think about, um, about how young people are often constructed, we think about that um, that being a teenager is hard, you know that you know like grade nine teachers go oh god grade nine students you know like like there's this kind of this trope about about being a young person is hard yeah being a teenager is hard it's a it's a difficult time and 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 we've got Hall to thank for that yeah for beginning us thinking around that now Hall started us off but then a whole lot of other theorists joined in on the on the action kind of taking Hall's ideas and then and then um building on them and Erickson was one of them you know Eric Erickson and his eight stages of man you know um and he uh 
the gift that he gave young people was he said that it, that that youth or adolescence again was that stage of identity versus role confusion you know and so how many times have we heard said or said ourselves you know that this is a stage that young people are going through you know this idea that young people don't quite know who they are yet and so um and so Hall said that being a young person was a dangerous time, a risky time, a time where young people need to be controlled and managed. Erickson said young people don't know who they are yet, um, that it's a phase, you know, that, that that they're going through phases, yeah, of so seeking out their identity. Um, from, from sociology, you know, functionalist ideas are around that focus of fitting back into society, and it's through functionalism that we see um, a need for education, a need for employment, a need to to kind of fit into being a neoliberal foot soldier, you know. Um, so all of these old theories, and they're all old theories, um, all frame often common sense understandings about young people, you know, and, and a lot of the, the, the theorising that came later accepted the original premise, you know, so accepted, okay, so... Being a young person's hard, Granville Stanley Hall says, you know, storm and stress. Let's research why young people are experiencing storm and stress. You know, so they accept the original premise and then the research jumps on from there. Yeah. And so that then continues to shape this idea that being a young person's hard or that young people don't know who they are yet. Yeah. And that construction's really kind of held through. It's held solid. Yeah. Um, even though the actual theorists have been discredited. They've kind of morphed into a common sense and even a practice response and a policy response understanding of, of young people. Uh, lots of those early theories individualise young people. They don't take into account um, the, the way society has an impact on young people. Um, but what we actually know... Um, about young people is that um, is that young people's lives are, are complex. You know, they're complex and they're intersectional. We'll talk about intersectionality um, later. That the challenges that they face are often exactly the same as people from other ages, from other age groups. Um, there are often intersections with those challenges around gender and race and and sexual orientation and culture and and religion and ability and you know all of those intersections. Yeah. Um, but what happens is that because they're a young person, these challenges are constructed differently and so they have different responses. And so if a 30-year-old experiences something, it's responded to differently than if a young person experiences exactly the same thing. Yeah. Um, and so in our work, we need to be constantly critically reflecting on how we're constructing young people, you know, and how um, how our organisations are constructing the young people that that we work with, um, and how um, those constructions are also reflected in um, in policy um, and in you know in the, the the kind of the dominant stories. What are the dominant stories that are being told about young people? Um, Howard Serkin, uh, you know, says that we that we live in a capitalist society um, and capitalism um, has given us a whole lot of positive things, you know, a whole lot of the, the um, you know, benefits that we see in society are, are a result of, of capitalism, but, um, but it's never generated equality. Capitalism is the antithesis to equality. The only way capitalism um, works is is through exploitation. That's that's what it does. Yeah. Um, and so um, and so it's never generated equality. And and Circum argues that young people disproportionately bear the brunt of that inequality. And especially if they live with multiple exclusions. Um, Giraud says that um, that young people are actually reflecting the world that they've inherited um, and that the world now um, is one that's extremely uncertain. It's 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 volatile. Um, it's it's unstable, unstable. Um, and um, and there's a whole lot of things that young people 
are really aware of that it's they're going to be affected by these things, but they don't have the power. They don't have control over those things. You know, things like climate change policy, um, and uh, and when young people um, uh, try to take action on those things, it gets shut down pretty quick, doesn't it? Yeah. And so, and so, you know, we can look at the ways young people are being constructed in the media. Um, and we can go, uh, you know, young people are just running amok or we can go actually young people are responding um, to the uncertainty, the volatility, the instability, um, and they're responding um, in a whole range of ways that that um, appear to be um, antisocial ways or outside of uh, what we what we might hope. Um, people would be would be doing um, recently you know we've seen the uh, the moves against young people in the name of law and order um, you know horrified to see um, a whole lot of adult people holding signs up outside government house saying you know lock young people up and you know tougher tougher law and order um young people seeing that are, are once again told that um that they don't count that they don't matter and when young people are told that they don't count they don't matter um well then why not either withdraw you know withdraw into phones and things like that or act out yeah uh, Giraud again, you know, says that um, that young people have been increasingly removed from the register of public concern, civic commitment, and ethical responsibility. They're being viewed as a bad social investment. Um, they linger in the public imagination as dim-witted, if not dangerous, ingrates, unworthy of compassion, and so justifiably relegated to the civic rubbish pile. That's a fairly damning assessment of how young people are viewed isn't it but I reckon there's a few young people and particularly you know that worst of the worst that keep getting touted that 10 percent of young people who commit 47 percent of all the juvenile crimes you know that the government keep telling us about I reckon they probably feel like this I reckon they probably feel like they are unworthy of compassion yeah and and they're the people that you are working with. Yeah. And so we need to be reminding them constantly that they are worthy of compassion. You know, that that um that they aren't dangerous, dim-witted ingrates. You know, that they are much, much more than that. Yeah. As um Sean Dinwright says, you know, they are more than the worst thing that's happened to them. You know, we talked about that a few sessions ago, didn't we? Yeah. And we'll we'll keep exploring uh, how we can see young people as worthy of compassion and what compassion looks like in a, in a minute. Um, Bamber and Murphy say that um, that young people, you know, not surprisingly, like uh, like most human beings, will get will behave in a socially constructive manner. That ain't rocket science, is it? You know, anyone who's given the opportunity to act pro-socially will act pro-socially. You know, anyone who's given the opportunity to take some responsibility will take that responsibility. Yeah, when people are, are trusted, then they will they will take that, they will move on with that, yeah, with that trust, with that respect. Um they they go on to say that, you know, young people might need to be helped to make contributions, you know, so we can't just like throw it out to them and go, go for it, you know, because that's setting young people up to fail. Yeah. So so we need to um, help them to make those contributions. But if if they get that help and they get that support and they have that sense of belief in their capacity to do to do that, to be successful, um, then they they will um uh take take action you know they will they will make 
decisions that have um, really important and powerful consequences um, that will make um, not just their world a better place, but the whole world, you know, the world that we live in a better place as well. Chiro again says that um, says that young people provide a powerful touchstone for for critical discussion about the long term consequences of neoliberal policies, um, which undermine any viable notion of justice, equality, and freedom. Um, young people are part of those social movements, um, and they um, and they are resisting, you know, and and that resistance needs to be taken seriously. And sometimes that resistance is enacted through in disorderly ways yeah um you know by by breaking rules yeah but but sometimes that's the way that resistance happens in in critical youth work practice we we seek to um to understand and recognize um, and and change um, structural and institutional oppression. So we think about the big picture. You know, we we think about all those structural inequity inequities that are in, impacting young people's lives. Um, we critique and we resist dominant discourses like capitalism, like patriarchy, like um, white supremacy, like cisgenderism um, um, we critically reflect on our on our own knowledge and power um, you know so how we think about things and we engage with young people in their in their humanness in their humanity um, in their diversity we respect them as experts with valid lived experience which is kind of like the polar opposite of what Hall and um, and Ericsson and others are are urging us to do, yeah, where um, young people's value is only viewed as what they're going to become. It's it's viewed as in the future rather than being valued for who they are now. Yeah. The purpose of youth work um, is about um, is about transformation. Circum says, you know, so um, and the transformation is is a a, a double-edged transformation, you know. So it's about um, about advocating for changes in social arrangements, so that outside story, um, and the inside story, so that young people can kind of see their lives as something that belongs to them, you know. So they have that that sense of of agency, yeah. Um, young people, um, are, you know, are able to enact their self determination. Um, ha, um, Circum talks about. Um, that there's an ethical element to this, you know, that, that we want young people to grow up good, you know, to, to grow up good, um, that a youth work practice that centres young people um, but sees them and, and steers them, you know, um, uncritically into, into um, uh, pathways of, um, you know, extended criminal histories or whatever um, isn't ethical. That's not ethical work. Yeah, so um, so that notion of growing up good. It's a tightrope, though, um, as as um, as youth workers, um, we work in that tension between helping young people to survive their exclusion, often by re-engaging them in things like education systems. Um, when we know that that education system is fundamentally flawed, you know, and that the education system is actually the source of, or or one, you know, one source of a whole lot of the issues that the young person's experiencing, but we also recognise that having an education um, can um, uh, can have an impact in terms of um, of connection to the criminal justice system. Um, health outcomes, homelessness, you know, like um, um, early early home leaving, you know, all of those things are connected, yeah. So we know that that um, having an education helps, but we also know that the education system is a challenging one, 
So we're walking this tightrope all the time. Yeah. As a housing worker, I supported young people to get housing. And I come from a housing first kind of approach to that. So, you know, I think that having having a house then uh, makes everything else easier. You know, having a safe, secure, affordable housing makes dealing with your mental health issues easier or going to school easier or, you know, reconnecting with whoever in your family, all of that kind of stuff easier if you have somewhere stable, supportive. So, but having a house also goes along with needing to pay rent, needing to buy food, needing to pay bills, um, normative ideas about what should be in a house, like a bed and a couch and a TV and a fridge and, you know, all of those kind of things. They all cost money. Yeah, so then you're going, okay, I want you to have a house, but in order to do that, you need to engage in all of these other systems that are really tricky to navigate um, and you've got to deal with neighbours and all that kind of stuff, you know, um, that are all tricky to navigate. So so youth work is walking a tightrope often, isn't it? Yeah. The relationship is key. Yeah, the relationship. We can't do this work without relationships. It is relationship-based work. And no matter how else anyone tries to construct this work, it always comes down to the relationship. Yeah, it can be a relationship that's established on a phone, you know, or or online, but, but nothing happens without a relationship. And it's our job as the workers or your job as the workers to establish that relationship and to maintain that relationship and to feed that relationship with love and respect and compassion and hope and all of those things. It's not the young person's job to do that. We hope the young person's going to turn up. And if we've done our work in feeding the relationship, then the young person will turn up and will keep turning up. Yeah. We'll talk about that more in a minute. I, I mentioned that anti-intellectualism, you know, that, that's kind of run through so much youth work and that and that I think um, is part of uh, what's kind of gone gone wrong a bit for, for youth work um, in terms of um, it being seen as um, being seen as uh, just something that people who care about young people can do um, rather than something that um, that people uh, who are um, uh, who have done some thinking about ethics and about theory and about you know and engaged in critical reflection and uh, you know, I started doing youth work in the 1980s and and you didn't need to, there wasn't a sense that you needed to go to even TAFE courses, you know, that stuff didn't exist, you know. Um, so people were just doing youth work because they cared about young people. There was some really good youth work that happened. There was some really appalling youth work that happened as well. You know, there was some really exploitative, appalling youth work that happened. Um, and so, uh, you know, I actually think um, we should have, bachelors of youth work you know we should there should be more than one youth work degree in all of australia um so that people can uh can really explore what it is to be a youth worker in all of the complexities but uh but that's not it's, it doesn't exist um and so we work with what we've got don't we now i am going to ask um Sirvash to um, pause the recording because I'm going to ask you to spend three minutes and I'm going to set a timer, three minutes writing um, your, your positionality. Who are you in the world? Yeah. Who are you? Not just in your youth work practice, but who are you? Where do you come from? Yeah. What's your positionality? And then and then we're gonna we're gonna explore that for a little minute, um, uh, which is why I want the recording to be switched off while we um, while we have some of those conversations. So, get your pens and papers out, or get your you know laptop or whatever you you know your phone or whatever you're gonna write. I actually I really want you to just do this, yeah. And I want you to spend three minutes because that's gonna get you past just. My name's Jenny Kagan and I'm, I'm a lecturer and, you know, it's going to get you past that. 
yeah, it's going to get you to go, shit, where, where, what, you know, where do I sit on this? All right. So are we ready to do that? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to set me a little timer and, uh, and see if Ash, can you uh, pause the recording? Yes. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so what I want you to think about, um, and we'll come back to it, um, but what, because of your positionality, um, do you see or not see and act on or, or not act on? Yeah, so so how does who you are and where you stand in the in the world influence the things that you see and the things that you act on? Yeah. Um, and I was going to have a conversation about that, but I think that could potentially take up all of the time that we have. Uh, so I'm going to keep going um, and just ask you to reflect on that, like while we're talking through some of the other stuff, and, and it and it might well inform some of the stuff that we talk about um, later. So, um, uh, yeah, absolutely, Alex. Yeah, um, it's it's hard to be succinct. Yeah, it it is complex. It's uh, um, to to just try and write a couple of simple things uh it's like it doesn't capture all of me yeah absolutely all right so i'm going to talk a bit about three things i'm going to talk about about privilege I'm going to talk about intersectionality and i'm going to talk about love and that's our focus in terms of of critical youth work practice um, and it's really about um, I'm not talking about young people I'm talking about understanding ourselves because I think the only way we can do a critical youth work practice is by knowing ourselves and not knowing ourselves in a performative kind of way but actually doing the work and knowing ourselves so that's that's the conversation that I want us to have um so let me just um well that was that yeah uh so privilege so uh you know i'm sure you've all uh or many of you will have um heard of you know peggy mcintosh and and the the work that she did around around privilege you know and so and so she um she says that privilege is that kind of unearned advantage um that uh that that accrues to to people, members of dominant groups, you know, um, and so you know, being white in a racially biased country, being male in a in a patriarchal society, being heterosexual in a homophobic society, those kind of things um, are what um, are what uh, result in privilege. Privilege is a really complex kind of idea, though, um, which we'll uh, we'll unpack because you know, often when you start talking about privilege, people will go. Oh, I'm I'm one of the privileged groups, but I haven't experienced a life of privilege. Um, and uh, and so when people talk about privilege, it can kind of shut people down. Um, one of the things that um, that we need to think about is that uh, a lot of the um, the opportunities, the rights, the democratic processes um, that are taken for granted. Um, were struggled for and implemented because oppressed people sacrificed their blood, sweat, and tears um, through collective action. So, the human rights that um, that support everybody um, were fought for by people who um, who failed to um, to receive those rights. Um, and so. Um, you know, I just think we need to uh, think about uh, from a place of when we're sitting in from a place of privilege, think about um, how the privileges that we have, um, where they have actually come from. People get caught up thinking about um, about individual privilege and actually kind of what we're what we're thinking about is um 
is that privileged group membership, you know, because when we think about individual privilege, then people go, oh, but, but I didn't come from a life of privilege um, and start and start doing that shutdown stuff. Um, but understanding your own privilege doesn't necessarily lead to challenging oppression. It, it's one step in the process, you know, where you go, oh, okay, I recognise that, you know, because I walk around in a white body, I'm, um, you know, educated, uh, you know, all of that affords me a whole lot of privileges that other people don't have, you know, and I recognise that. I also recognise that because of my queer identity, I um, experience and have experienced oppression, you know, so my privilege is a complex, you know, is it, it isn't just a, just a one-way kind of thing. Um, uh, but just recognising that I have white privilege doesn't mean that I'm then going to challenge white supremacy. Yeah. It, so just recognising something doesn't lead to action. What you need to do is recognise that because I, because of my white privilege, I am a beneficiary of white supremacy and therefore I'm complicit in the structures that produce oppression. And when I start thinking like that, then I start thinking differently about privilege. And and then my brain can go, oh, shit, I don't like this work. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm... I, and and Kumashiro talks about um, about um, people being led into a state of crisis. You know, like getting to that kind of stuck place. You know, and the and the stuck place can be either um, uh, being stuck in, you know, in no, I'm a good person. I'm not complicit in oppression. You know, in any way, shape, or form, um, uh, or you could be stuck because you're consumed with guilt because you realise that you are complicit with oppression and you need to kind of process that before you can move on. Um, uh, and so and so thinking about, um, about how um, as a holder of privilege we are complicit in, in oppression um, and thinking about that in the context of our work with young people um, where young people are a marginalised group, um, and that, and that um, uh, we are in um, positions um, uh, that that have power um, that can influence young people, um, then we need to think about uh, how we might be complicit in um, the oppression that young people are experiencing. Um, you know whether it's just age-based oppression um, or whether it's a more intersectional version of oppression. Um, which leads us to thinking about intersectionality. Um, and um, Kimberly Crenshaw um, was the first person to really have us thinking about intersectionality. And I think that... Um, that thinking and talking about intersectionality um, begins in a problematic way if there's a failure to recognise that the whole idea of intersectionality came from a black woman. Um, and often white academics um, fail to recognise that, that history um, when they start talking about intersectionality. Um, and so, you know, we begin with Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, and so, uh, you know, I like I like the way that she um, frames intersectionality in terms of that traffic through an intersection, you know. And so, uh, you know, um, uh, if an accident happens in an intersection, it can be caused by cars travelling from any number of directions, you know, and sometimes from all of them, you know. And so we get to picture a person um, being harmed because they're in the middle of the intersection, you know, and that that harm can come from 
sex discrimination, race discrimination, age discrimination. Yeah, so um, um, so uh, when we think about our work with young people and we think about it in terms of intersectionality, um, I think it's kind of helpful to put young people in the middle of that intersection and go, you know, what's coming at them, you know, and 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 what's the what's the monster truck, <laughs> you know, what's the really big thing that's going to just like ram over everything, you know, is there a monster truck or a, is there just a whole lot of, you know, is there cars, is there motorbikes, is there buses, what are the big things, what are the little things that we need to consider, and at what point does a motorbike turn into a monster truck, you know, and 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 as long as we're kind of seeing that young person standing in the middle of that intersection, then we're going to need to consider all of those things, all of those elements, yeah, that, that are going to that are going to run through them. It, um, intersectionality is about is about power. It's about seeing where power comes and collides. Yeah, um, Crenshaw says it's not simply that there's a race problem here or a gender problem there, or a class problem, or an LGBTQ problem there. Um, many times that framework erases what happens to people who are subject to all of these things. And I think it's really instructive to think about um, the fact that Crenshaw uses the word erases here, um, not just obscures, but actually makes makes it go away, makes it disappear. You know, so if we only get caught up thinking about a young person as a criminal and we don't think about the young person as an Indigenous young person who's had history of of um, of um, structural disadvantage on the basis of their race, on the basis of their location, on the you know all of that kind of stuff. Then we just see them as criminal, yeah, and and everything else is erased, and and that's what we see in the juvenile justice you know um, rallies and things like that. I was holding up a sign there. That's what that was um, in in the rallies that that happen. Yeah, it's a, it's an erasure of all of the other things that are influencing, uh, that are impacting a young person's life. And so, intersectional approaches think about how race, class, gender, and all of those um, um, uh, intersecting systems of power operate. Yeah, um, it looks at how people are produced in relation to those inequalities. So we see you know, the black lesbian, yeah, um, you know, the, the young person who has a disability, yeah. Um, and so, and, and then we think about how the solutions are also constructed um, within those, those intersecting systems of power. So power operates through the way we do our work, yeah, and what are we seeing or not seeing and acting or not acting on um, um, in our work. Uh, Patricia Hill Collins asks um, whether intersectionality has become performative. You know, we all talk about, oh, I practice intersectionally. You know, it's part of our practice framework. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Intersectional practice. That's part of my practice framework. Yeah. But do we really think about um, about what intersectionality is and and whether because of our positionality, we see some intersections differently than others, or we don't see some intersections um, or we act on some but we don't act on others um, hill collins says you know if practitioners don't pursue intersect intersectionality as critical theoretical possibilities it could become just another form of academic bullshit you know so um uh you know it could become another idea that came and went jim ife says that the social worker can't be neutral uh, that, that we're actually required to take sides. Um, and particularly if we think about a critical um, social worker or youth worker, yeah, um, we've got to take sides because we can't be neutral. We can't be neutral in the face of injustice. Then we're just perpetuating the status quo, you know. So we've got to say, no, this is wrong, yeah. Um, and and a, a, a more mainstream kind of version of practice has this misinformed idea that a social worker is objective, a social worker is neutral, yeah? But all that does is prop up a neoliberal idea of how you do youth work, yeah? Um, critical reflection um, is part of, um, of uh, 
us understanding ourselves, but um, but it needs to be a critical reflection that recognises um, our complicity in in oppression, you know. And so um, that that complicity in oppression is, um, you know, we're complicit even if we don't benefit from it. Uh, I mean, if if we do benefit from it, even if we don't seek that benefit, you know, it, it doesn't need to be an intentional benefit um, that we gain. Uh, and so it's not about the intent of the individual. It's just that that things that are in, invisible, you know, there's things that I don't even need to think about when I leave my house, you know, and, and that a young person needs to think about all the time, and particularly a young person who might be Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander and living in, you know, Mount Isa or Townsville. They need to think about this shit all the time, you know. They need to think about, you know, uh, Aboriginal families have to have conversations with their young people about about how to respond when a police officer pulls them up because that's going to happen. I don't even need to think about that. I don't need to have that conversation with my children, you know. That's privilege, isn't it? Yeah, that's an effective privilege when I don't even need to think about things. Yeah, um, I can only become part of the solution when I recognise the degree to which I'm part of the problem. You know, not because I'm white, but because of my investment in white privilege. Yeah, because I'm a beneficiary of that. In social work, human service kind of stuff, we we talk about critical reflection all the time. Yeah. And, and it is, it's, it is good practice, but we need to just not just reflect, we also need to act. Yeah, it's not enough to just go, upon reflection, I see that I feel defensively angry when you suggest that I examine my privilege, um, you know, that, that it's too scary and hard and I don't want to change, you know, and I've reflected on that and I'm aware of that in myself. It doesn't actually move us anywhere, does it? Yeah, all it does is go, okay, I've kind of, you know, provided a bit of a self-critique. I've confessed that I find this difficult, but I haven't actually moved forward because moving forward is uncomfortable. Yeah, taking action is uncomfortable. How are we going? Doing all right? All right. We're going to talk about love. Yeah, we're sliding through these things and we're going to talk about a practice of love. Yeah, what the hell? Talking about love? What do you mean? You know? Well, when we talk about love as part of the way that we frame our practice, it's about recognizing um, all of the, the the social injustices that that impede the achievement of social justice. You know, so Bell Hooks um, writes about about love bell hooks in you know all about love oh, there we go all about love bell hooks um you know among other books you know but uh but um you know says says i really believe that love as a political transformative force in our society can change the world it's been love that motivates people to the most deep and profound change it's not about going soft it's about knowing what can save our planet which is people connecting, communicating and showing loving kindness. And so thinking about love as a, as a practice in, in youth work um, um, is, is I think how to, how to, how to move forward, you know? So, so um, various writers talk about, about love, you know, and so um, love as ethical practice is about letting go of the desire for control. It's about engaging in dialogue. It's about hope and faith and courage and trust. Um, it's about critiquing power. It's about recognising complexity. Um, it's about nonviolence, you know, and, and, and thinking about structural violence, not just, you know, violence, yeah. Um, systemic violence it's about looking at that those interconnections um, it's about activism you know and so love can frame all of these things yeah um, it, it challenges neoliberal capitalism it challenges patriarchy and racism and and um, um, heterosexism and cisgenderism yeah love 
provides us a way to challenge all of those things. Godden writes about, um, and there's references at the end, you can look things up, um, you know, writes about how do we practically apply this idea of love in practice, you know, and so, and so being reflexive about how we perpetuate inequality, recognising mistakes, um, embracing humility and resilience and, and, and practising self-forgiveness, you know, and that willingness to change, um, uh, practising um, love for colleagues, you know, and so upholding fair workplace conditions as a practice of love, you know, um, that, are, that engender equality and rights. Um, building healthy collegial relationships through collective purpose, through teamwork, through open communication and mutual respect, all the things that neoliberalism and managerialism doesn't want us to do, yeah. Um, a, a love for community, so, um, uh, you know, including the love for, for service users, so supporting, empowering social work programs um, that aim for equality, um, working collaboratively, um, a love for, for humanity um, and so um, embracing that global consciousness of, of solidarity, being active global citizens, a love for nature, so recognising that we're part of, a, of, of an ecological community, um, that relationship between, um, between people and planet and that spiritual love, so, you know, the ways that we connect in, in bigger pictures and, and celebrating um, the relationship between Indigenous peoples and the land. Working from a place of love takes courage. It's about being vulnerable. Um, uh, it's it's about um, it's about standing with the person. It's about holding the space. It's about um, being um, fully and compassionately engaged with. The young person that we're working with, um, it's about that engaging in that open-hearted practice. Um, Bell Hook says to live our lives based on the principle of a love ethic, which is showing care, respect, knowledge, integrity, and the will to cooperate. We have to be courageous. Um, learning how to face our fears is one way we embrace love. Um, our fear mightn't go away, um, but it won't stand in the way. And often we don't change our practice because we're fearful. We're fearful of losing our job, which is a legitimate fear. <laughs> you know, we're fearful of getting in trouble. We're fearful of, you know, up, upsetting the, the the apple cart. Yeah. Gita Marota says, you know, we, we move in the direction of the questions that we ask, you know, and so um, we need to think about whether we are working towards and asking questions about about joy and healing and liberation uh, because that's how we support a practice that moves towards um, towards transformation, towards social justice. And, and at the end of the day, um, we come back to that relationship that we have um, with each other, you know, at the, uh, with, with, with the people that we work with, you know, at the heart of a good youth worker is a beautiful spirit a quality of connection um, that's positive and hopeful and good, and that's where transformation um, comes from. The most important resource for the young person is you. You know, with all that you bring, you are the most important resource, yeah, for that young person. So there's a bunch of references. Uh, that's where we get to. Um, and now what I want to ask you is um, what are some of the drivers of love in your practice? You know, and I'm thinking, uh, you know, things like compassion, respect, hope. You know, so what are some of the things that you can draw on that could be aligned with a, a practice of love. Let's start unraveling this a bit. Um, yeah, I love that. OK, 
okay, we move in the direction of the questions that we ask. Yeah, humility, empathy, connection, empowerment. Yeah, empowerment, empowerment. You know, empowerment's a really interesting one, isn't it? Yeah, because empowerment's been co-opted and weaponized by neoliberal forces, hasn't it? Yeah. So what do we really mean when we're thinking about empowerment? How can we think about empowerment from that place of love, thinking about social justice transformation, you know? What does empowerment look like? Feel free to crack open your microphone and, and speak words. You don't just need to chat, yeah? Collective strength, yeah. Giving the young person the power over the, over their lives, yeah, is what empowerment looks like. Focusing on what the child or the young person can do rather than what they're struggling with. Yes, yes, that strengths-based stuff. You know, and that's the stuff that Sean Jin Wright says, hey, what are your assets? What are your strengths? Yeah, yeah. I'm being trauma-informed. Yeah, yeah looking at behaviours from a place of empathy and love and thinking about trauma in that bigger picture, of bigger sense of trauma, hey, you know, not just that post-traumatic stress disorder kind of frame for trauma, but thinking about the way structural injustice creates traumatic, traumatising environments, yeah? And so we keep putting young people back into those environments, yeah? What... Um, what makes a practice of love challenging in your workplaces? Um, red, is red tape. Yep. Yep. Red tape. A focus on compliance policies. Yes. <laughs> yes to all of those things. Absolutely. Yes. Time. Yep. Frustration. Jen, uh, Rach wants to say something. Yeah, Rach. Sorry, I think I. Um, no, don't apologize. I, I didn't want to jump in. There's so yeah. many good things coming up. I think for me, I had this really in, interesting parallel. I think for me, and it goes back to that first um, conversation with ourselves about our positionality, and I can yeah. I can stumble around how I entered into youth work through ongoing education I can really define why I stay and I yeah. think for me something I was writing down was and just in this previous paragraph like we were talking about I think for me my sustained position really reflects finding my action because mm -hmm. as neoliberalism theoretical developments are weaponized to maintain neoliberalism. I think yeah. you really have to be challenging your own ability to find your actions, to yeah. stay in it. And I was yeah. really having a think about it. I heard something, this is off topic, but it really mm -hmm. brings me back into mm -hmm. the intersectionality about how vulnerable our young people are. Um, and I read somewhere that... Um, the police officer in the Northern Territory that's um, recently got a lot of interest for coronial inquest around his practice. I mm -hmm. read somewhere that he ended up working in the Northern Territory because he failed the aggression test in Queensland. And I think about the intersectionality of a structure that says actually no, and then there's another structure that receives it, and the outcome of that was a young person who under the age of 25 is still a young person. Yeah felt the consequences of that. Now, if yeah. we look back at Queensland, okay, no, you're not well enough to be a police officer, but we've got the same state apparatus removing the rights of young people, the human rights yeah. of young people, arguably because of a large cluster of people that have voting uh, power impact, yeah. wanted 
an outcome. And I just think to myself, in that same week that there was protests on those steps of Parliament in Queensland, mm -hmm. Australia had farewelled the 44th woman um, victim, sorry, victim, because gendered violence can and interpersonal yeah. family violence is both male and female. We just yeah. go, we just said goodbye to the 44th person who arguably with a lot of children in the same situation and sectionality for young people, what's that yeah. motorbike? What's that bus? What's that yeah. kid that's going to turn yeah. into a rock? What's that thing that's going to smash them? And I think having worked in the front line, whilst I probably have privilege in the sense that I could select my education, coming from New Zealand, I experienced racism. And that's when I, the first thing that popped into my mind, mm -hmm. I really jumped into youth work because of that. One of the that was one of the icebergs, mm -hmm. um, but I think with the burnout, and I think arguably burnout comes from the emotional and intellectual tolerance mm -hmm. we have for the social injustices around us. Yeah, it's really how do we perform love in the face of that burnout as well? Do you know what I mean? I think I've gone off topic, but. There was a lot of stuff happening in there for me and it was just so interesting, particularly yeah. the way we came back and looked at what is intersectionality, motorbike, yeah. bus, pebble, yeah. rock, yeah. just the person walking beside you, they may, you know, inadvertently take your advantage purely because you both turned up at the same place at the same time. Yeah. You were identified based on what you look like mm. or acted mm. against because of that. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Mm. That would be the summary. <laughs> <laughs> Just thinking about burnout, um, because I do think you know that uh, th that frustration, that you know that 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 working in managerial environments, we see it all the time. That 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 absolute frustration where people go in with good heart, you know, with with joy, with love, with compassion, and it just gets oh crushed out of people, you know, and and for me. I think that the solution to burnout is justice doing, you know, and so, and so when we're going to burn out, we're totally going to burn out if we're only focused on the the the, the hard stuff that's happening in our organisations and the hard stuff that's happening for the young people that we immediately see, but when we start talking to other people and we start networking, you know, we go to interagency meetings, we go to um, you know, we're, we're members of statewide networks, all of that kind of stuff, and we're involved in the justice doing. That's what kept me being a youth worker in housing for 17 years, you know. That's what kept me there doing that because I was involved in my local interagencies, the statewide youth housing peaks and the national youth housing peak. So I felt like I was doing something and I was talking to people outside of my work you know, and, and people would say, you know, I'd have students on placement or, you know, or, or colleagues or whatever, and I'd go, oh, I'm going off to interagency meeting, and they'd go, I've got too much work to do. You know, and you go, no, that is the work. Yeah. You know, that's the work. That's the thing that's going to give you life. Yeah, yeah. and life in itself will become the love for what we're doing, so it sustains it. Yeah. yeah. And, and the thing is um, we need people who have been in this work for a long time. Young people deserve that and and new youth workers deserve that, you know, and, and not jaded, twisted youth workers, but, you, you know, youth workers who who see the importance of justice doing, you know, of this work as, as, as transformational work um, because that's then inspiring for new workers to go, oh, I can... I can see a pathway forward, you know, where I can do that and, and I can create change, yeah. Alex, you've been kicking around for a long time. Kate, you've been kicking around for a long time, you know, like just picking on a couple of names I, I recognise, you know, like like we need people like you to to be hanging around in doing direct practice, you know, and not seeing direct practice as something that you do in the beginning and then you move on to policy work, you know, but to be staying in, in that direct practice, you know. Dan, can you hear me? Uh, it's really quiet. I don't know what's going 
Can you turn your phone up? Trying. Is that any different? That's, that's yeah. That is. Yep. That's good. Right, cool. Um. I've yeah. I've been driving along, and I wanted to chime in, and and this linking into your question around holding love in our practice, as well as justice doing, and. I agree with you. I think what's kept me in this work for so long is the ability to move up and down. I think some of my hardest days have been in the system and trying to work yeah. with the system. Um, but in, in the face of the immediate um, injustice young people experience or the limited options, like absolutely, those are some pretty heavy moments too. Yeah, It's that ability to move up and down and, and sort of say, what are we going to do about this? both ways which I think keeps me ethical and healthy mm -hmm. um, but I actually think about those micro practices we have to hold love and justice doing in our work and thinking about intersectionality and my privilege it's it comes back to sharing for me I, I, I've been really drawn to sharing as we're listening whether that's sharing information, the knowledges that we've built, whether that's sharing resource that we have available to us, mm -hmm. you know, even sharing laughter or just that yeah. gen sharing that comes when you're holding love in the work with the young person within your professional boundaries. And, yeah. um, you know, I think of, yeah, it makes me think of a few few different things but it's sharing a meal together yeah um you know yeah. and, and the transparency of saying hey work's gonna pay for this because this is actually being together you know like and yeah. so that sharing process it's sharing intention it's sharing yeah. sharing um the knowledge of how we're navigating this uh with boundaries so i share the power in the process each time um, you just make what you're doing transparent. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. like, it, it takes me to a time, and, and this might make some people uncomfortable, but it takes me to a morning where, um, you know, essentially I took a toasted sandwich to work for the young person that I was picking up. And, and like, but it was a negotiated thing because, mm. Um, we we had to book this super early appointment and in the process of saying what's it going to take for us to be together I don't know probably 7 30 in the morning what are you going to need um, you know, what am I going to need how are we going to get there on time all of those things it's yeah. like, it's also like we can talk about it with skill development, executive functioning, um, you know, all of that stuff. It's like, hey, I'm going to need food and we're not going to be able to stop on the way because there wasn't yeah. time. We're going to get up at 6.30 kind of thing, right? I'm going to take a toasty. Do you want one? Yeah. Right? There's many people or places where that might be a not an okay thing to do. It might work the okay thing to do yeah yeah so i'd love to hear from others about the micro ways they hold love and justice doing with young people in those everyday ways yeah yeah love is a toasty yeah yeah absolutely other people you were the invitation was there to share toasty stories I agree so much, Kate, with what you with what you've said that it's that it is it's those little things, isn't it? You know, because because we need the big stuff, right? We yeah. need the big stuff, but it's kind of it's the same kind of principles around self care. Yeah. You need the holidays, you need the big things like the end yeah. of the week. But what are the everyday micro little things yeah. that you're doing so that you get to the end of that day and it's yeah. not the when you get on holidays yeah alex hey yeah hey. um I, I was thinking earlier when you were talking about the challenges and showing love was um i guess sometimes the physical support of um yeah um of showing love and i guess 
one thing I'm lucky enough in my workplace to a lot of the young people coming in, they, they generally are um, in some sort of community. So like when a young person is in a state of um, kind of emotional t turmoil, um, being able to get one of their friends just to be like, Oh, Hey, like, mm. you know, that they could really use a hug right now. Um, mm. And then having mm. them as a community kind of support each other um, mm. without crossing any kind of, lines as a, a social worker yeah yeah belonging is such an important thing isn't it you know to have a sense of belonging um and it can be belonging with a community of other streeties you know it can be you know it, it's it can be belonging in really anti-social ways you know which is what we need to then you know think about but it's that sense of of belonging um, can um, be transformational for young people. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, oh, sorry. Do you want to go, Kate? There you go. This is why I stuck my hand up. I get a bit tricky with the etiquette these days. I'm like, I want to jump in, but then so does someone else. <laughs> it's very hard on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking, in terms of what um, your, sh your sharing was, Kate, um, and also kind of truck and trailers with. Um, the community young people are in. Sometimes our young people are so marginalised because they're learning through their behaviours and some of those yeah. behaviours make them not attractive to their same age peers. Yeah. yeah. Um, we become, especially in residential settings, we become that fine line between a peer and a, you know, how do we, you know, work with you? Um, and I'm... In terms of taking a toasty, I was working with a young person who, um, as most young boys do, they love cars. Um, and one of the things we did in the afternoon was I just suggested we go for a drive because also he so was so insular in his neighbourhood and it was just like, this doesn't feel right. Do you know what I mean? Like, what's mm -hmm. going on? Let's change the furniture around, give you a bit of different wallpaper. So I started mapping out just pretty much Sunday drives, Monday to Friday, taking us from west side Brisbane, the country way, into a mall he'd never been to, yeah. something safe and non-triggering. And I remember a colleague saying to me, wow, Rach, that's so good that you do that for him. And I just was just like, I didn't, we had the resource, it met his need. Yeah. It challenged what he was able to accept as valuable for himself and he saw someone enjoying we didn't really talk too much because he wasn't a chatter so I didn't push that but I just thought to myself yeah. that was some way we kept love in a very challenging dynamic as well but also sometimes we need to find those ways to step over where the gaps are as well until they yeah. become filled in and yeah both, it, it's about um, spent sorry I'm it now, I'm taking it um I both what I've just heard. I've I've met, it was your name Rachel. Yeah, or Rach, just Rach, whatever. Rach, and what Alex is saying, something jumping out at me, is the skill set and the not like is the link between our theory and our knowledge and the skills of being able to listen for the verbal and non-verbal yeah. in how it comes to us about what that person is saying yeah. and what that person is needing. And um, that, that this comes back to all of what we've been saying about critical youth work practice because you have to be open and you have to be focused on them as opposed to focused on a policy that says, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not, yeah. A checklist that says have I covered things off this is about genuinely being open in those spaces to read the situation navigate resource knowledge pathways whatever it is you know yeah. switch back to that collaborating and sharing and then drawing on like Alex's example of then saying and then how do we make it possible to get what you need yeah um, and yeah, and that that's from the felt to the physical. They're all can they're all valued at the same the same rate. Yeah, um, and 
And what strikes me about that, right, your example was um, was that in a, in a managerial, you know, tick a box, what's your KPIs kind of thing, driving a kid in a car every Sunday, um, there isn't a box to tick for that. It's like, well, where were you driving to? What were you doing? What was the appointment? You know, like that kind of stuff. And it's like, no, this actually transcends all of that. This is about yeah. building relationship. This yeah. and, and for the young person, they get to say, this worker wanted to spend time with me. Yeah. They weren't doing anything, you know, yeah. like they just wanted to spend time. Yeah. And- more than that, Jen, though, because it's also about the intersectionality stuff you're saying. It's also about opening those doors in everyday ways to say, this is what else is out there. Yeah. And that's completely appropriate and on anyone's checklist. It's called community access. It's yeah. called, uh, you know, community network building. It's about yeah. um, identifying aspiration. Yeah. If somebody doesn't you don't know what you don't know so simply by being exposed safely to new horizons yes someone who's going through a transition and is developmentally in a space where they're growing and needing to to actually learn and extend this is our work yeah yeah Yeah. it's justifiable it makes me think of the you know, the breakfasts I've taken young people to before school and they've never ordered off a menu before or, you know, all yeah, all those things. But there's, yeah. they're life skills. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think I we, would, don't, uh, we don't see the wins. Oh, sorry. I was just, uh, Rachel, I was just going to do a timekeeping. It's actually <laughs> five o'clock. And I oh. know we started five minutes late, so we would like to go to five past five or ten past five. People want to continue the discussion. Yeah, I'm happy I'm to go I'm as long to go. as people are happy to stay. I, so I'm curious about the people. If there's anyone newish in the space, whether or not they've got any fears about holding love in their work that they'd want to put out there safely because if we don't talk about it we can't we can't yeah work with it we'll write it in the chat jump in here (laughs) yeah um, Hi, so Megan. I'm a, hello. <laughs> um, yeah, before when you were like, I get to see people I've taught become youth workers. Yeah. Here I am, Jen. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, so obviously very new to the space and um, learning as I go. And it's just been really great to hear you guys open up about how you've been practicing love and seeing that as, like in, in a very real way of how that's practiced. And I don't know, for me, it's quite inspiring and a good learning experience, just hearing. Mm. And yeah. Uh, I think, I think Megan, you know, that's uh, what I was saying about, about, um, about the importance of workers who have been there for a long time, Um, you know, being, being part of that inspiration and mentoring um, for new people coming through like like you um uh you know just to go oh that mythology that trope about oh everyone burns out in five years you know that I hear students saying you know and and there's living proof that that doesn't happen you know and so then you get to go well how does that not ha- how did that not happen for you how did you avoid burning out how you know how have you managed to sustain um working for as long as you've been working in direct practice you know for you know 10 years 15 years however long you know how have you sustained that and and you need people to be asking those questions of and and that everyone hasn't just moved on Alex you did you want to say something I just your camera's on so I was just wanted to give you the opportunity if you wanted to say something 
No, sorry, I just got uh, disconnected in my camera. Oh, no. Okay, so sorry, I didn't there, want to but... put you on. I wasn't putting you on the spot. Sorry. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jen, I um, just wanted to jump in. I'm um, just uh, as um, this discussion has been going on, I guess one of the things that came up for me was, um, um, I guess, the importance of that self-awareness that you were talking about, um, about uh, privilege, for that not to become a guilt. And then so that guilt uh, then driving a practice of... Uh, pity and um, help do you, do you know what run. guilt yeah, yeah so guilt it's more about of... that sort of self-awareness um, sort of being about structural power and then yeah. it helping um the i guess the development and achievement of uh collective empowerment because i don't believe mm -hmm. empowerment is something you hand over workers let's empower young people yeah. we get empowered yeah. together there and it's that you know, through that sort of awareness as opposed to the interaction of uh pity or um yeah help yeah yeah G guilt is is part of fragility you know as soon as you start going to a place of Oh, I've just learned that I'm complicit in oppression. I'm so guilty about, you know, I'm feeling so guilty about it. You just you're making it then about you. You know, like once again, the the person who has privilege is making it about them, you know, and not about about challenging challenging structural inequities or, you know, uh, challenging the oppression. It's just like you just go into this place of of oh, well it's I, it's all about me and and even when you go, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for all the oppression I've caused. You know, that's still about you because you're wanting a response and you're wanting affirmation that you're one of the good ones. You know, that that exceptionalism, that, you know, that, that, that you know, that, oh, no, I'm one of the good ones. I'm a social worker. I'm a youth worker. I'm one of the good ones. You know, no, you're still a beneficiary of white privilege or you're still a beneficiary of, you know, whatever kind of privilege. So actually you do still have work to do, you know, and, and we move past that place of guilt uh, into engaging in conversations, in learning that um, Jim Ive talks about, about, you know, that stepping aside, you know, stepping aside, um, standing behind, standing back, you know, um, providing the space for other people to um, to be heard, not a, not giving permission for other people to be heard, but by standing away, you're, you're creating the space, you know. Um, yeah, handing over the microphone, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there's room on the podium for all of us. You know, <laughs> I say that to, you know, gender critical feminists, you know, who are worried about non-binary people claiming the identity woman, you know. No, there's actually room for everyone on the podium, you know. Everyone can, there's room for everyone. It's okay. You know, you're not going to lose something just because someone else is, is you know, claiming some space too. You're not going to lose. Yeah. <sighs> Jenny like this this conversation has drawn me a couple of times back to what you were saying about the myth of neutrality mm. has been a really really critical part of my work my, my practice framework the whole time is you are not neutral and you will yeah. never ever be neutral because yeah. simply by being yourself in your skin you show something yeah. and um, you know, like that we practice withholding judgment, but we also need to make judgments because we are actually making assessments and we're doing a job. Yeah. And I think when, you know, if somebody is sliding into the space of fragility and, and you know, saying, oh gosh, you know, and then probably also claiming that they're really neutral, it's all serving the system. Yeah. Because it's it it put, keeps the power in the system. It keeps the power in their role to be like, well, I hadn't any influence there. We yeah. have influence in everything we do, whether yeah. or not it's spoken or unspoken. Yeah, and it's actually about stepping in and saying, how have I influenced this situation in this moment? Yeah, that's what we need. That's yeah. what I encourage us all to be doing constantly. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. was it better or the worse? Unintentionally or intentionally? Like all yeah. of those. 
Yeah. Kate, as you were saying that, I was thinking, well, it, those judgments that you're saying, like every second of youth work, it's like that. And it's really values judgments. And it's that highlights the need for that values clarification for us to really know what value base we come from. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's that it's that irky space, that slippery space between youth work, that old, maybe old model you were describing Jen where it was all about um heart so let's say all about love but no critical function yeah so all about oh you know they just need a fair go and we're just gonna you know give them yeah. everything we're just gonna hang to then the other side of the scale the the neoliberal side of the scale where it's very boundary and very like well this is what we do to keep people safe and and protectionist so it's yeah. you know really paternalistic it's this space in the middle which is saying you need to hold love and genuineness but you also need to be engaged with judgment assessment reflection to keep it real yeah yeah absolutely yeah that was the bit that has just continued to ring for me too and um I think it's a it probably is the same way we can connect with young people, but when we are deeply honest with how we would prefer to make a decision in the future, mm. when we hit that intersection in ourselves, what do I need to take care of for me so that I grow more to benefit the young people yeah. that may be in the same situation in the future so I don't roadblock it? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, we are the tool of our practice. Exactly. And I think that, um, you know, our emotional hygiene is needs to be up there with, you know, any of the finer professions. Do you know what I mean? It's all a skill set that requires our tolerance for our own learning. Yeah. And Absolutely. be able to say on the day or three weeks later, hey, I actually did something wrong or, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. oh my gosh and the power of saying i too am human i too yeah. am contest and learning like yeah. no yeah. one is perfect and and is that not what we want to model is that not what we want to actually say that it's yeah. it's not about perfection it's actually about responding to what we did in a moment and then learning from it and responding again yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm, definitely and then it's also like paying attention to where we stretched our own boundaries to receive something reciprocal from a young person in a healthy yeah. way. Going back to the conversation yeah. with the young person in the car, my thing is for quite some time is if the food's open, don't eat it. I don't know where it came from. And it, that's just that's just probably a bit of OCD in me, but I knew I'd created a, another level of rapport in a safe place with this young person when he handed over like an, his last wagon wheel. But I mean, it was open to ear, it was on his hand, and it's a teenage boy. So lots of things are going through my mind, but I had yeah. to accept that and show him that I was meeting him. In yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So yep. those moments where you've been together for three hours because you've been to Centrelink and you've had to do something else and whatever. Oh, and Centrelink, just, what a job. And they just need water, and you're like, hey. Oh. Here's my drink bottle. Water bottle if you want you know and then I know I'm just not going to drink in it but yeah. like until I can clean it but that, but you know just in the sense of actually you need the water and I can get more really easily right yeah. and it's a I'll different to, be... to that young person too I will share a human need with you yeah, yeah. it's yeah. when you it's when you meet a young person's humanity with your humanity yeah you know that we are actually two humans coming together and doing this work together. No, that's, no, uh, no, that's, no, with, uh, some, that's with some boundaries, I was going to say, because of course, uh, after of course three hours of um, Centrelink, you probably want to tell to the young person, you need a bottle of rum, but you could just give them water. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. And you could understand why the young person saying, I wish I had a durry, as if you let me go around the corner for 10 minutes and don't look. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. but I can't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hey, uh, yeah. just doing the second timekeeping, we're coming to 5.15-ish. Happy again to continue or 
I, if people want to indicate in the chat comment, if you think that uh, this conversation is useful and we want to continue having perhaps another session, we can like, you know, schedule at some future time. Um, happy either sort of um, options, but uh, just wanting to make sure people, if they got, uh, particularly Jen, I know, like, you know, being here and everybody else, if um, you have other things to do. I do have other things to do. I have my 20, my son who turns 20 today. Uh, oh. I need to go and hang out with him. Uh, so I, I do need to go. But but what I wanted to do before that is, um, is I wonder, I, I want to ask people, um, what's one thing that you think you can commit to doing that... Um, reflects the conversations that we've been having. So whatever you take from the conversation, what's something that you can do in your workplace this week? You know, that might be a practice of love, conceptualised broadly as per the conversation. Feel free do to I share it or not share it, but I want you to think about it and I want you to actually commit to doing something this week i was going to jump in because i haven't said anything yeah um i totally agree with everything that's been said i've just been sort of happy listening but i think in my role at the moment um it would be more about making sure probably the residential youth workers that i work so i'm a case manager that are working in that yeah. more daily practice feel that they have i guess the support and the space to be taking those decisions as well yeah. because I feel like sometimes like I'm more than happy to go take young people for bubble tea and go to the creek and go for a drive or whatever because I feel confident that I can yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know that it you know it serves the young person that serves my you know our relationship and that is a bigger yeah. story but I feel like sometimes the less experienced workers maybe don't feel mm -hmm. confident to make those decisions mm -hmm. so I think mm -hmm. in terms of something I can commit to commit to it's about sometimes I guess giving support for the less experienced staff to be taking yeah. those decisions that are based on building relationships as a really important part of their work yeah yeah and so um uh Godden would talk about that as the love for colleagues mm. you know in that in in those practices that that she talks about yeah, mm -hmm. that creating an, an a good working environment, you know, a supportive working environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. I love that commitment. Yeah. Does anyone else want to share something? Otherwise, we'll we we'll probably need to think about winding up. I was just mm -hmm. in the same space because now you know I have a team and I'm not directly practicing right now, and just. One of the practices I used to use all the time when you had the free postcards in the cafe next door, I'm really rude that they're not there because I'd just grab something symbolic and write something I'm really grateful for for each of oh. my. And nice. I was thinking about that before today, and it's something I want to do again. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Something really practical and tangible that has real meaning for a young person. Hey. Yeah. Yeah, we all like to get recognised like that, you know, don't we? Alex, you said invest time with volunteers. Service would yes, absolutely. Your service wouldn't be able to operate without them. Um, yeah, invest time to talk about love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That humanity side of things. Yeah, absolutely. I see the night cafe as you know somewhere that's always held that line about practicing with love you know compassion you know and so i think it it can hold on to that space because that's part of its core isn't it you know that's at the very heart of it love is at the very heart of it compassion is at the heart of the night cafe it's yeah. such a, a beautiful spot and yeah we were just talking about it today there seems to be two kind of patterns especially at the moment past covid is there's um every everyone attending tends to have um some complex behaviors at the moment or complex mm -hmm. things going on in their life but um there's 
either people coming together as a group and having a lot more social support and supporting each other or the people more individualized and um yeah it's interesting how those two different things affect things and yeah yeah yeah, yeah absolutely mm. yeah like, like like you said night cafe i think i don't know whether it was kate or so, some, someone talked about it earlier about like sharing meals and the importance of sharing meals and yeah i, I think that's yeah. what the night cafe is all essentially it's, based it's on it's all about yeah 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 it's so societally just normal for us to sit and share meals yeah yeah 